right, well, we're uh, just thankful that you're here. If you're new with us, we want to welcome you here. Uh, this is a great day of celebration because Easter is a significant day. You know, I mean, when Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago, if Fox News or CNN had been around, they would have covered it live. <laughs> It was an amazing, amazing event. Well, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the significance of the cross. Uh, before we do that, though, I want to just, uh, just talk about uh, significant um, uh, icons or, um, or logos. You know, companies uh, like, uh, well, all kinds of companies, right? They, they will sit down and they, they will have brainstorm. And they'll say, let's have... Uh, a rally point. Let's have a logo that when, and branding that when people see this logo, it will mobilize them to want our product or our service, right? So I want to just give you a couple logos and I'm sure you can guess them. They're pretty easy. Here's the first one. Right, Nike, right? And Nike, when you see that, you're supposed to think, uh, if they've done their job, that you think success, right? Well, they, if I wear their product, I'll be successful. That that's, uh, was designed to be like a portion of a wing, uh, Nike, of course, is the, uh, refers to the, the goddess of victory. And, and so that's what they want to communicate to you. You wear this, you're going to be successful. Here's another one. Apple, all right, doesn't get any easier than that. And Apple's, you know, they're a computer company. They, they want you to know you use their product. You're going to have access to technology, to knowledge. You have all this knowledge and knowledge that wasn't available, you know, for centuries now is at, at your fingertips. And so you use their product, you're going to have access to knowledge. Here's another one. McDonald's, right? What's that about? Uh, indulgence, pleasure, right? The Happy Meal. You got to have that. Here's another one. Mickey Mouse, right? You go to Disney, you are in the happiest place on earth. They are saying that you're going to, you're not, you're going to be entertained. You're going to have joy. You're going to have happiness. Who doesn't want that? Here's, here's another logo. Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz, those, those, it's been around for, for a long time, right? And so 100 years ago, the motor represented, uh, domin it represented power over the air, over the sea, over the earth. And so that's the three points. And so that's what it's communicating is that, that the, this idea of power. Uh, just a few other old ones I wanted to throw your way. Do you, do you know this one? Yeah, the RCA, right? The dog looking in the Victorola going, where's that noise coming from? And here's another one. Right? Right? When it, when it rains, it pours, and it pours salt. <laughs> and one last one. Quaker Oats, right? It's something, I don't, I'm not sure how the old guy connects to the oatmeal. Maybe it's like pure oatmeal or something. I don't know. Quaker, right? Yeah. So those logos... They're, they're, if they've done their job, they say, we want you to, oh, if you want to be successful, you know, if you, want, if you want success in your life, if you want knowledge, if you want pleasure, you want happiness, if you want power, use our product. And so here, it's interesting that the church 2,000 years ago, this, this little group of people that they're trying to add numbers to their group, they're, they're struggling, and they... I'm just wondering, who, do you know what logo they chose? They chose the cross. They chose the cross. Now, the cross, you know, was known as a, uh, as a way to kill people. I mean, we're concerned about giving people a little cocktail of drugs to put them to sleep nicely when we're executing them. And so they, they're having a hard time getting that, the drugs to execute people. You know, we want to do it humanely. Well, the cross was anything but a humane way to execute somebody. Persians invented it. Alexander the Great really started using it quite a lot. And then the Romans took it. They perfected it as a way to, to try to put down uprisings. And they, it was excruciatingly painful and humiliating. And to, so they used it all the time to put down revolts and, and, and rebellions. And, 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 and it was known as, as an object of scandal, of, of uh, pain, of torture, and, and, and the church chooses this as their, as their logo. Hey, that's our logo. I just wonder who came up with that idea. Could you imagine the, you know, the Virginia Power hiring a company to come in, we need a new logo, and they go, well, we think you should have an electric chair 
and below it say, the power is on. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, who would, you just wonder, whose idea was it to choose that? But that is the church's logo because it does stand for, for what Christianity is really about, what Easter is all about. You see, sometimes people think Christianity is about prayer or going to church or about reading the Bible or serving others. All those things are fine, but without the core thing that's going on. Those are just religious things. That's no different than any other religion. And so it's the cross that sets Christianity apart. And that's what the Bible talks about. In fact, all the way through the Bible, as you read it, you see kind of this thread that you see over and over this, these foreshadowings or flash forwards of this is what's going to happen. There's going to be something significant and it's all pointing to the cross. And so I wanted to just show you a few of these this, uh, this morning, and then we'll, we'll, we'll just kind of summarize and just talk about how does the cross really apply to us today, okay? Well, one of these threads you see is with this, this person named Rahab. She lived in Jericho years ago. You have, it was right around the time when Moses had led the Israelites out of Egypt. They get, they're, they're, they're going into the promised land, God's judgment is coming on people that had sinned. And, and so they are, they, Moses sends a few guys in as spies into, the, into, the, uh, into Israel. And so these two spies come in. They're, they're going to be killed. Rahab, who is not an Israelite, she lives in Jericho, but she's not an Israelite. She's not, she's not part of them. She's a prostitute. She, but she saves them at a lot of risk to herself. And so she says, would you, when God's judgment comes, would, I would like myself and my family to be saved and to, from, from judgment. And so they make this pact. And here it is. It says, now the men said to her, this is to Rahab, these two spies say to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land, you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. That's how they're going to escape. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and your family into the house. So the, that's the, the agreement. Is that you, she, has to, she has to hang the scarlet rope. Or in the old King James translation, it says the, uh, a, a scarlet thread. This, this, and, and what it is, is it's a crimson thread. It's, it's foreshadowing the cross. It's saying that judgment's coming, but judgment won't come for those who have this scarlet thread connected to them. And so you see really this thread weaving its way <clears throat> through the whole Bible. You go start it with uh, uh, Adam, and, Adam and Eve. They uh, were with God. They had community with God, and yet then they sin. And when they sin, there's all of a sudden shame and this guilt, and that always happens when there's sin. I mean, we all have known that when we've been exposed, we did something that we wish we hadn't, and maybe somebody saw it, or some, somehow people found out, and we kind of this tinge of pain, you know. God, I wish that, you know, this guilt, the shame, a little, and that's, that, that goes on throughout all of hum, humanity. Well, this happened to them. They, they had this close relationship with God. All of a sudden, they sinned, and now they, there's this pain and this separation, and God's wants community with humankind, with, with, with his creation. And, and there's this separation. And so to bridge the separation, you see this scarlet th thread take place. <clears throat> God he says, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So in order, in other words, because of their sin, because of their shame, their, their nakedness, he clothes them with this innocent blood of an animal. And so there's something because of this, because of of sin, there needed to be payment for that. And so th there's the, it's foreshadowing what's going to happen at the cross. Years and years and years later, you have uh, another example with Abraham. God desires, he hasn't given up on his desire to have community with, with mankind, with humankind. And, and so he, he comes up with this covenant. He goes, I'm going to make a covenant with Abraham. And I'm going to bless all people through Abraham. Now, God is a God of covenant. In fact, a lot of people made covenants back then. And covenants were often made by kings to get land rights or water rights or trading agreements. And they would make this, this covenant. And so they would get something. What does God get out of it? Well, he doesn't get anything. He gets, but he does get community. He wants to be connected with the people that he created. 
And so he goes through Abraham, through this covenant, I'm going to bless. I'm going to bless everybody. He says, I will bless those who bless you, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. He's talking about this covenant. You know, over 280 times, the Bible refers to God as God of the covenant because he loves covenant. He, he's a, he, he, that's part of who he is. That's part of his nature, his character. And the way the covenants were made is, is they, they would actually call them cutting a covenant, and then, and then you, would be, you would walk through the covenant. And the idea was is they would take this animal, they would cut an animal in half and put a piece on either side and then you would walk through. There's blood on both sides and you just walk through it to symbolize this covenant. And and the symbol is, is, may it be to me, what happened to these animals if I break this covenant? So he makes this covenant with, with Abraham, and here's an example in Jeremiah 34, verse 18. It says, those who have violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walk between the pieces. So there's this covenant walk. See, you walk through it, and, it's, and, and there's payment. That's, it's not a light thing. You break a covenant. It's not like, oh, everything's okay. No, it's a big deal. There's payment that needs to happen. And so... Uh, you, you know, kids kind of pick up this a little bit. You know, when I was a kid, I don't know if kids still do that today. But if you really wanted to make a serious promise, you'd say, I promise, you know, and, and, and I hope to die, right? Take a needle in my eye. I, don't, I mean, that's, <laughs> I never had to do that. I'm glad, but, but that's the kind of like, that idea, like, this is a serious deal. That's the kind of covenant that's going on. And so uh, here you have this covenant where this, uh, there's animals, there's a, there's a calf, there's, there's a, a heifer, a ram cut, and, there, and, and, and notice who walks through this covenant made between God and Abraham, or also called Abraham here. Abraham brought all these to him, these, these, uh, these animals cut, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other when the sun had set and darkness had fallen the smoking fire pot with the blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces so here's god of the covenant with abraham and notice who walks through it it's god god is associated uh, with smoke and fire just like mount sinai he's the one who walks through and he's and and he's not going to break the covenant but if humanity breaks the covenant he says i'll pay the price that's the scarlet thread. That's this, this thread that you see that all throughout Scripture, here it is again with, with Abraham, this covenant walk that God does. And then God's people in, in Egypt, they're in slavery there. There's judgment that's going to come upon those who the, the slave masters. And so God comes to his people and he says, here's how it's going to work. I want you to get a lamb. And you're going to slaughter that lamb. You'll have a meal from the, of the lamb. And, and if the people are too poor, the, you, you invite them in. The neighbor should invite them in. Because everybody can be part of this. He says, take the blood of the lamb, this unblemished lamb, a perfect lamb, and put it on the doorpost. He says, when judgment comes, it'll pass over them. That's where the word Passover comes from. That's what it means. Passover means God's judgment was supposed to come on sin. And because of this sacrifice because of this 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 thread the scarlet thread it passes over there's no judgment it says the blood will be a sign on uh, for you on the houses where you are and when i see the blood i will pass over and so you have this this thread again of passing over pointing to the cross that's going to happen when on that passover day there's going to be a Passover of God's judgment on all of humanity's sin. And then you have another example of this in, in, in Israel's high holy day. Their highest holy day, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. This is a day when, when uh, uh, the high priest would come and he would intercede for all of the sin of his people, the entire nation. He would take these two goats and on, and on one goat they would... Uh, they would, they would slaughter it and put the blood on the Ark of the Covenant, the Atonement Ark of the Covenant. And then the other one they would leave alive. And then they would, and, and they, the way they would choose is they would do lots. And so it's kind of like God chooses the sacrifice. And then they would take the other goat 
alive and they would, the, the high priest would confess the sins of the people while laying his hands on this, the head of the goat. Notice it says, uh, he is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins. I want, that'd probably take a while, right? You know, and then, and, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into a desert into, in, in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all the sins to a remote place and the man shall release it in the wilderness. So those of you who have read the old King James translation, do you know what this goat is called? I'm sorry, scapegoat. That's where that term comes from. This is the scapegoat. And, and so he, he, he places all of the sin on this goat and then, and then they get rid of it. There's an appointed person. Some traditions say that's a Gentile because the Israelites didn't want anything to do with this goat after it had all the sin on it. Right? It's a, the sins of the whole nation on this goat. What do you do with that? You get rid of it, right? You take it to a remote place. This idea of anywhere but near me, right? You've heard of that acronym, NIMBY? Not in my backyard? You know, we need prisons, right? Where do you put a prison? Well, you know, well, we need them. Well, how about in your backyard? No, no. Somebody else's backyard. What about a garbage dump? Or what do we do with toxic waste? Well, not in my backyard. This is kind of the same idea that this goat has all the sin on it. Let's get it out of here. Put it in a remote place. Presumably to die, right? Presumably to die. And so this is this idea of this, this goat going away. And, and this is the idea of atonement. That's why it's called the day of atonement. And so for one day, people that sin, they know they've said things they shouldn't have done. They, they've made you know, they've just done stupid things. They've hurt people. Whether you manipulate or flatter, you deceive, use, exploit, gossip, demean, oppress, marginalize, judge. Every time you wrongly treat somebody or God's creation or violate uh, God's character or his moral laws, all of those things. See, we all know intuitively we've dropped the ball there. And so for one day on the Day of Atonement, they could kind of breathe well, that's been forgiven, but only one day then. It starts all over again. See, it pointed to something greater. It's something greater that there would be somebody who would atone for your sin once and for all. Let me ask you, that's kind of just a question. Who are you trusting to atone for your sin? When you confess it, where does it go? Who takes it from you? Do you just pretend it's gone? Do you just, just assume you don't do it anymore? See, the Bible is very clear about this, that when you sin, there's, there's a, there's a, there is a scapegoat, and it's Christ that's pointing to him. He's the one who takes our sin. So when you confess it, you give it to him. You say, God, uh, Christ is my, you know, Christ is the one who interceded for me. He's the one who died for me. Notice it says uh, about Jesus, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It's talking about Jesus. Now, the, the Bible was written in Greek. That word, when it says the word was, was made God, that is the word logos. It's where we get our word logo. That is the logo. That's the branding of the church. Not success and power and pleasure and, uh, and, and entertainment and knowledge. It says, no, it's the cross. It's, it's, that's the need, deepest need that all of us have, that we come to experience what, how God forgives us. We don't have to live with the pain of, of being separated from God, of being distant from Him, of not having a close relationship with Him. It's Christ Himself who bore the sins. He was that unblemished lamb. The Peter said, who knew, who knew and loved Jesus, he said, by His wounds you have been healed. And so you see this scarlet thread coming together in one person. It's in Christ. And when it was time for him to die, he went to Jerusalem. And he uh, met with his close friends in the upper room. And he had, a, he had a meal together where that meal was on Passover. And so they had a Passover meal. They reflected on what God had done and how he had had that scarlet thread. He had had the lamb's blood that delivered them from the people from, the people from their sins. From, and, and delivered them from slavery. And, and then Jesus said, 
That was in the old covenant. And then he, he says, there's a new covenant. He holds, part of the Passover meal was to have wine. He holds this cup of wine. He says, notice it says, he says, this cup is the new covenant. They knew what he was talking about. They knew they couldn't uphold the old covenant that they had, you know, as hard as they had tried, they, every time God would intervene and have uh, this, this uh, idea of, hey, I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something special for you, we would, we would just fail. And he says, this is the cup, this, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. It's poured out for you. Jesus Christ did the covenant walk. He's the one who uh, his blood was poured out for you. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It's, it's Christ who, who took the sin of the world. And he can make a difference in your life just like he did in mine. I've invited a member of our church to come up and share her story about well, how Christ changed her life. Would you give Nicola Smith a warm welcome, please? Good morning. My name is Nicole, and I've been attending Vineyard Community Church for almost 13 years. I'd like to share with you my story of how God's faithfulness and grace have impacted my life over the years. Growing up, I wasn't raised in a church. In, middle, in elementary school, when a close friend would go to church every Sunday, all I knew was that I was missing out on something. The first time I went to church with her, I was full of questions. During the service, I was invited to accept Christ into my life. And on that day of eight, that's what I did. I would not go back to church with her since shortly after that, I would move away. Most of my childhood and teenage years were filled with taking care of my younger sister and brother and cleaning the house since my mother got a divorce in my early teen years. My mother and I didn't have a good relationship growing up and it made it more challenging with her working a lot outside of the home to take care of my, my siblings and I. When I was 18, I became a single mom myself. I had to make the best of a situation that I had found myself in. I worried about the little life I was carrying and how I would raise him. When my son was about three months old, I got into an argument with my younger brother that would result in me moving out of my mother's home the next morning. I carried a lot of pain from that experience. I was working, pursuing my college degree, and raising my son alone. It was tough. I had sleepless nights and felt alone with no one who knew what it was like to be me. If that was enough, during this time, I was in a terrible car accident. And after one year of physical therapy, I was still left with permanent damage to my hips and my back. Life was physically and emotionally painful. God would provide comfort through the pain with, from, with words from friends of encouragement and of his promises to see me through. I did, however, surpass my doctor's expectations in my recovery and walk better than they ever expected afterwards. But as many of you know, I do it in a pair of heels. <laughs> <laughs> Almost exactly one year after that, ac that car accident, I went to the doctor and was told that I had cancer just five days before I was to receive my degree. The word hit me hard. I was confused and questioned after all that I'd already been through. Why me? A close friend who came into town for my graduation made me promise months in advance that no matter how much fun we were having celebrating, that we would be in church on Sunday morning. I agreed, even though at the time I didn't belong to a church. That morning of their flight, I had gotten the mail, but left it on the kitchen counter. That weekend, they noticed a flyer amongst the stack of mail. It was an invitation to come to this church, Vineyard Community Church. That Sunday morning, we walked in, and Pastor Andy's message was about being in the tunnel of confusion and God being there with you. It was as if he knew exactly what I was going through and he was talking directly to me. The person sitting behind me introduced herself and shook my hand, saw the tears running down my face and asked if she could pray with me. This woman didn't know me. She didn't know what I had gone through or even what I was facing. I was alone, unsure about my future or my purpose, not knowing what would happen to me if something happened to, if something, what would happen to my son if something happened to me? To tell you the truth, I was worn out from life already. Nonetheless, God had placed her in my life, even for a short time, to remind me that he was with me. That moment will stay with me forever. You never know what kind of impact you can make on someone else's life. That person's prayer would go on to start a fire in my faith. There have been times when I felt alone or unsure of what to do. 
yet God remained faithful in being with me in the form of this church, friends, and family. Even when my heart was broken by relationships, God helped me to let go of bitterness and resentment. He healed my heart in a way that released forgiveness for the hurt and the pain caused in my life. I prayed that God would put people in my life and my, friend, and my son's life that would walk with us, love us, and help us carry us through even during the difficult times. It came in the form of this church and the youth ministry that would help raise my son to be the young man he is today. It comes in the form of finances that, allows, that has always provided for my son and I. God's healing has, an, has, always allowed me to stay, has also allowed me to stand here cancer free and healthy. Mm -hmm. I've even seen my relationship with my mother restored. The Bible verse that I will remember and care with me the most is Jeremiah 29 11. It states, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God's love is free if you want it. There's nothing you can do that God won't forgive you for or no circumstance that he will not be there for you. His purpose for my life has become clear, that I'm to share his love with others, walk with others in whatever stage of life they are in, and serving his people with the gifts and plans he has for my life. And it all started with a decision I made to accept Christ into my life, a decision that I'm so glad I made. Thank you. All right. Great job. Well, the question still remains, who are you, who's your scapegoat? Who are you wanting to look to help you resolve the issues that go on in life? the challenges, the sin, the things that keep us separated. The con you know, when we sin, what happens is it causes us this, this separation that our conscience is, is dulled. We're not close to God. And, and, and when we try to resolve it, I only see really two options. One is to try to do it on your own. Say, I'm just going to figure out a way on my own. I'm going to be self-sufficient. I'm going to make this work. But the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so there's this separation that happens. There's nothing we can do about it. And we end up frustrated. The other option is just to say, you know what? I'm going to accept God's provision. He's the covenant walker. He's the one who's provided. And from the beginning of time all the way to today, he has made a provision for me. That's the other option. Now, I don't want to insult any of you. But I really think the reason why some people just decide to not depend on Christ is just old-fashioned pride. I mean, I've got it in my own heart. This, I, this stubbornness, and I'm going to do it myself. I don't, and certainly, I don't want to have to admit and bend a knee and say, I have sin and I need a Savior. But that's really what it comes down to. It's spiritual warfare that's going on in our lives. Did you know that your soul is being warred over? It's true. And God says, I have had a desire to have community with you. He wants to be close to you. Even when we resist him. Even when we say, no, thank you. He's saying, I still made the provision for you. I still want to be close to you. Notice this last verse on the Bible. I love this, this verse. It says, we can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for, right? Yeah, somebody's worth dying for, you die for him. And we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfless sacrifice. No doubt about that, but listen to what God did. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatsoever to him. We were just saying, no, thank you. I'm not interested. I don't see the value. And yet he said, this is the way. This is the only way. I want to close with this story. A guy named Max Dupree. He's an older guy now. He's written a number of books. One book was called Called to Serve. He tells a story how he was a paramedic during World War II. And during World War II, out on the, the battlefield, they would go out and they would have bags of blood for transfusions as was needed. And there was Allied troops that were wounded. There was Nazi German troops that were wounded. And they would go up to these, uh, to these guys and, and they would offer the blood. Now, at that time, they, they had this policy where they would put the names of the donors, the people back in the States who had donated their blood, on the bags of blood. Kind of a moral thing, saying this is the person who donated. This is the reason you're going to be able to, you're going to, be able to live. And they would go up to these soldiers and they would say, you're going to die without 
this, this blood. And uh, Max and a few of the other paramedics, it wasn't military policy, but, some, but Max, he would take, the, and, and some of the other guys would take the Jewish blood, they would see the names, they would take the Jewish blood, and they would only give that to the German Nazi soldiers. <laughs> and he'd go up to them and he'd say, you're going to die without blood. Do you realize that? And I can, this, somebody's donated blood to you to keep you alive. And they would say, and they'd say, but it's Jewish blood. And a number of them would say, I want to live. I want to live. I will take Jewish blood. But then there was some, because of their pride or whatever gets into the human heart, they'd say, I'd rather die. Let me die. I'm not going to have Jewish blood on me. And then they would just pass out. And then they would give them the blood anyways. <laughs> Keep them alive. You know, there's a story in that. There's, there's something in our heart that says, I don't want the Jewish blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, the God's son who died for me. But that's really what the heart of Easter is all about. We can pray and go to church and serve and do things all day long till the cows come home. But unless we have the blood of the Jew, Jesus Christ, on our lives to, to atone for our sins, it is just religious hubbub. That's what God wants. That's what Easter is about. St. God, God says, I want community with you. I do have, like Nicola read, he says, I do have a plan and a purpose for your life. And this is what it's all about. Okay, so I'm going to bow. Let's bow our heads and pray. I'll lead us in a prayer. I invite you to pray along with me. <clears throat> As you kind of contemplate and say, this is my turn. This moment is for me. Now, if it's not been clear before, I want to make it very clear. God has a scarlet thread he wants to weave into your heart. It's about the cross. It's about this moment in time. When you say, you know what, I, I've been trusting in the wrong things to resolve all of those things that I've done or haven't done. And today's your day. Would you say, just in your heart, would you pray, say, Heavenly Father, I confess to you today that I am a sinner. And I understand that when Jesus went to the cross on that very first Easter, he was taking my place. He was my covenant walker. I broke the covenant, but he paid the price. And just say so real clearly right now, God, forgive me of my sin. Give me the grace of, of, of your, and, and the forgiveness as a gift. Nothing I can do. And Lord, I thank you. Would you say, God, thank you for the resurrection the promise that there's new life. And with everybody's head bowed, some of you, you've, you've made, maybe you've said a prayer like Nicola did when she was a little kid. But the truth is you're not really walking in that. Maybe your heart's heavy. Maybe you're carrying a burden around. Maybe it's, maybe it's guilt that's unresolved. Maybe you've got regret, some pain in your life, and God wants to whisper to you, that that scarlet thread is for you right now. It's for you. All of your sin, past, present, and future, has been placed on the head of somebody else who has carried it to a solitary place, to a remote place. You are forgiven. You are cleansed. You are made whole. Well, Heavenly Father, this Easter, we're grateful. You're the great judge, the great creator of all. And yet you would come in, in a, such a vulnerable way to live among us and then to sacrifice on the cross for us. Lord, we, we, we love 
you. We want to serve you. We want to be part of your community here and in, 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 into eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.